Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We're champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Lu Ngo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Sarah Boost. And on this week's episode, we are going to talk about the evolutionary purpose of sadness. I love the topic name. It's just something to think about. When you think about sadness and in the context of happiness, well, it's definitely something we probably don't want to experience, but it is there. And I think today, if we are able to learn about its evolutionary purpose, it's even going to be better. And I'm excited to talk to our guest of the day today, Dr. Chuck Schaefer, about this topic. We had a really lovely chat earlier, and I know it's going to be a great conversation. I would love to introduce our guest, first of all, and I will get him to also introduce himself. Uh, Charles Schaefer, PhD, is a licensed psychologist, clinical advisor, and adjunct clinical faculty member at New York University who has been teaching people and organizations how to use the latest research to overcome anxiety, mood, and sleep disorders for over a decade. Schaefer was previously research director and guest host for the Dr. Friss show on WWRLAM radio in New York, New York. His writing and expertise have been featured in Psychology Today, HuffPost, Vice News, and NBC News Health. His book, When Panic Happens, Short Circuit Anxiety and Fear in the Moment Using Neuroscience and Polyvagal Theory is being released by New Harbinger Publications in July and is available for pre-order on all major online sellers, including Amazon and Barnes & Noble. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. And that was a fun fact I learned. And I have to say, I just, I've never met anyone who lived, you know, right down the street from Brooklyn 99 Station. So... That's just something that, I, I mean, I, maybe the audience is not that excited about it, but I know I am because I love the show and I have told you about it. Um, so yeah, really excited to talk to you today, especially about your expertise, not about Brooklyn Nine-Nine per se, but you know, that's another podcast in itself, not for this show. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Chuck. Yeah, no problem. And no, I can absolutely talk about Brooklyn Nine Nine and psychology <laughs> all at the same time. Hey, maybe we can use some references. Yeah, we could use some references. Yeah, maybe some references along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I would love to get you to share a bit more about your professional journey, especially, you know, how and why you got into this line of work, because, you know, I love this field and I think it is something that, you know, more people need to know about, uh, but not a lot of people choose to study it, I would say. So, yeah, what's your story there? So, yeah, my story is I went to school originally to study English and I wound up discovering this guy, Henry James was a pretty famous uh, New Yorker and guy that wrote a lot of travel. And then uh, his brother, William James, who actually invented psychology, American psychology. It's like, talk about a power duo living in New York. And so I read his book and I realized in the analysis of, of Henry James's Turn of the Screw, I loved psychology more than English. So I switched and I never really looked back. And I decided to stick it out in the field because after doing some clinical work, I realized how few men were in psychology and how much I enjoyed the experience of working with people, especially fathers and uh, men going through hard experiences in their life, which is a lot of what I wound up doing these days. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing the story. And, you know, it's just a beautiful thing we hear, you know, all the time on this show where the guests talk about their journey, because a lot of the guests on the show are also like yourself, you know, psychologists in the field. And um, it's just great to hear how you got into the field in the first place, because it's never like, oh, yeah, I just I knew that I wanted to do psychology. It's always like, oh, I was doing something else. And then I was like, psychology is a better fit you know, get mm -hmm. into it. Um, so yeah, that's really, really great to hear. And I myself have been thinking about psychology a lot more since I started doing um, these mm -hmm. shows with LMSL. And so I've been 
talking to all my guests about the fact that maybe I also want to get into psychology. So, you know, that's a whole other story in itself, but it's fun. Um, and today we're here to talk to you about sadness and its evolutionary purposes. And, you know, you were kind of mentioning to me that you also have a book coming out that's kind of related to this topic, which we'll find out in a little bit. Um, but before we get into all of that, let's get to know you even better. And we have this part we called, Have You Met Dr. Chuck? We're going to get to know mm -hmm. you through some of your favorite things. First thing first, what is your favorite book? So my favorite book, I guess it's cheating, is just basically any X-Men comics. Oh. Because I'm a huge Marvel Comics fan and I collect and have read pretty much every X-Men comic since the early 90s. Um, oh, this, amazing. This absolutely what I've been, I'm super excited for the next Marvel wave because it's supposed to have the X-Men in it. I know. I, I, I know. Was gonna say. I'm pretty pumped. Yeah, well, okay. Spoiler alert for those who have not watched Captain, like the Marvels. And oh, I have not, but I will okay. take the spoiler. I knew what I signed oh. up for. I knew. Okay, do so you want to take the spoiler? Into... I'll take okay. The spoiler. Okay, you take the spoiler. Okay, so yeah. yes, the new wave of um, Marvel movies featuring the X Men have been teased in the after credits of the Marvels. That's what I heard. So, yes, I'm so, I'm so mom. excited. I'm very a Marvel excited. girl. So, yeah, very excited. Uh, but yeah, no, we, we cannot get sidetracked because otherwise we'll never leave this podcast. Now, <laughs> what is a movie that you've been enjoying recently? So a movie that I've been enjoying recently is around this time of year in the States, a lot of people rewatch, like I do, Nightmare Before Christmas by Tim Burton because we're right between those holidays. And so it's like right now is the perfect time. So that's really what I've been into. I've been rewatching those movies. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, for our audience, uh, just in case this episode comes out after the holidays, mm -hmm. we are recording this just before Christmas. So this is an exciting yeah. time of so year. It's, uh, it's an interesting, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, fall time right here in New York. People love this time of year here. Yeah, wonderful. Now, um, you're our podcast guest today, and I know that you've been on radio yourself, but I actually, I'm wondering if you actually listen to podcasts yourself. And if you do, what is your favorite one? So my favorite podcast is called Chapo Trap House. It's a very funny political podcast. Um, <laughs> and it's pretty much the only news I kind of want to get because everything else is pretty intense. And without humor, I don't know if I could get through a lot of stuff. Speaking of sad, ha happiness and sadness. Oh, that's interesting. Because mm -hmm. I, I just, for, for the life of me, I just cannot get into understanding politics because it's so heavy a little bit for me um so yeah that's interesting i would definitely note that down give it a go well, thank yeah. you for sharing now i would love to know if you have a role model or multiple role models and if so who are they uh i don't know if it's specific i guess the dream including the cardigans i wear is somebody like uh mr rogers you know mr rogers from mr rogers oh, not neighborhood really. In, in the United States, there was a psychologist that had a TV show when I was a kid called Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And okay. there's a whole movie about it with Tom Hanks. So you can see it now because there's a whole movie about his life with Tom Hanks in it. And he basically was a psychologist who decided to help children by making a TV show for them. And so oh, he, has, he spent 30, 40 years of his life just making programming to make kids feel OK, learn about their emotions, deal with grief. Uh, really inspiring. So that's kind of what I hope. I don't think I'm going to have that big of a reach, but I, I hope to have that kind of impact on people's lives to help them out a bit. Oh, beautiful. I had no idea. But yeah, that's that sounds great. And, you know, yet another thing to discover. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing. And finally, in this part, we would love to get to know a little bit about you through what you like to learn. So what is a sure. course you've completed that really inspired you? Sure. So recently I just completed a training in ketamine assisted therapy. Uh, and it's really, really inspiring because you get to learn about all the different ways that these new psychotropic medications like uh, ketamine and psychedelic medications actually change people's brains, making it a lot easier to do therapy, makes it a lot easier for people to access things like their sadness or their fear or things that you really need to be able to talk about in order to do something like therapy. Oh, cool. That's really mm -hmm. good to know. Thank you for sharing. I think that is something that I've been hearing a bit more about these days, especially, you know, getting to host mm -hmm. these podcasts. Uh, some of the guests have started talking about things like psychedelics. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, well, what is that? That's interesting. Because, you know, it's such a new thing for, you know, the common folks like myself. So, yeah. you know, it's good to learn about that. So thank you for sharing. And no today we are here once again to talk about the evolutionary purpose of sadness. I, I do believe that this is such a 
a great topic that we're going to discover more about today. When I saw the topic, I was so excited because I was like, okay, we've talked about sadness on the show before. Absolutely. But, you know, talk about it from an evolutionary perspective is definitely different and interesting. So um, we're going to get to know this topic in depth. And in the context of happiness, mm-hmm. first of all, we would love to ask you for your take on the concept of happiness, because each person sees it very differently. Sure. I guess I have a couple ways to see happiness. From a purely psychological point of view, happiness is just an emotion that tells you to do something again. So it's a, it's a bunch of warm, fuzzy sensations that are created by a bunch of chemicals, usually dopamine, that's being dropped out of your brain through your nervous system that basically tells you, do this some more. Now, sometimes that's good for you, sometimes it's bad for you. But whatever it is, you're going to be getting the same sensation each time that makes you want to do it again, which usually means you're experiencing happiness. For me personally, it's like a warmth kind of feeling and a lightness at the same time in my body when Mm. when I know that I'm happy. Mm. Yeah, beautifully described. I think it's definitely uh, something different for each person. Like, you know, the way that each person describes happiness just changes. And I feel like that is the nice thing about psychology Mm -hmm. or like just life in general. Like we see it differently. Um, And speaking about seeing things differently, you know, obviously people will have different ways of viewing their happiness in life. Mm -hmm. But I guess as a psychologist yourself, uh, I'm I'm sure you've talked to a lot of people, you've done a lot of research. Mm -hmm. Um, You might notice there are certain things that people just get wrong when it comes to happiness. And of course it is subjective, but there are probably major things that people just tend to misunderstand or, you know, um, see in a way that is not beneficial for them when it comes to their happiness. So to you, what would those things be? I think the biggest thing that people make the mistake of with happiness is thinking it's an accomplishment. Like it's something that you achieve, like the end of a level almost in a video game. (laughs) Instead of seeing it like any other emotion, it's, it's sort of a passing signal of different sensations you're getting throughout your body. That's just kind of telling you something right now in the here and now about what you're experiencing. And just that whole process can happen so quickly for so many people and people have different folks that have taught them what happiness means, what it should be culturally. So there's a lot of different mistakes people might make in that that respect. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And uh, that's what I've learned through, you know, the, this podcast myself, which is the fact that emotions are not bad. You know, all emotions are signposts and happiness and sadness, they kind of go hand in hand. And today we're talking about sadness in the context of happiness, right? Uh, It's such an interesting topic because uh, I think a lot of people, when I cross paths with them and, you know, obviously not my close friends per se, but, you know, some people are just kind of saying, I just want to be happy (laughs) all the time. And, you know, like, where is that thing? Like, what is that thing? And I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) What is that for for you? I have no idea. But I don't think it's feasible to be happy all the time anyway. So... I guess it's more about understanding the spectrum of all the emotions in life and what they are teaching us. And that's really hard, right? That's that's a skill just to be able to understand different feelings you're having in your body and then give it a word that mm-hmm. you can share with somebody else. It's a lot of different processes. Yeah. Um, I think we really underestimate how hard it is to just know what we're feeling in any moment. Happy, sad. These can exist at the same time. That can be really confusing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that confusion stops us from trying to understand it in the first place, because a lot of the times I don't know about our audience, but for me, like earlier in life, I try to run away from such Mm. emotions. And um, I think it was hard for me to deal with uh, those tough, especially sadness. And now as you know, as I've aged and learned about these things. It's a little bit easier to handle Mm -hmm. and to understand, but it's still a hard thing to to grasp because, you know, there's so much going on in your head and um, all around your body when this happens. Um, So let's talk about sadness because, you know, by now our audience is probably wondering, okay, so what exactly is the evolutionary purpose of sadness? So what, which role do you think sadness has played in, you know, in our evolutionary development? Well, I think there's a lot of different theories that all kind of converge on the same idea where sadness is the initial emotion we all kind of express as babies and infants. 
Because what does a baby do in order to get attention? What do you think? What's a baby do to get attention? We'll throw a tantrum, cry. Right? They're going to cry, though. You're going to see something that looks a lot like like sadness, right? Yeah. And so sadness is kind of one of the first emotions, and it's so primitive because it's effective of pulling people towards us for our own survival. If an infant couldn't get responded to from crying, which sometimes happens, sadly, but often doesn't, but if nobody responds to an infant, they won't survive. If that infant's crying enough, they're always going to get responses, they're not necessarily always going to, the person responding is not always going to like it, but the infant's always going to survive based upon that. And so the evolutionary purpose of sadness is for us to get care from the group, from the folks around us, because we're a very social species. Mm-hmm. This whole homo sapien thing is it's pretty, pretty social. Mm. Yeah, I think from that perspective, it's certainly interesting because uh, I think of the general population like and our audience who are tuning into this podcast episode, they're probably just trying to think, uh, of a way to deal with their own sadness, but not necessarily going back to the root and think about, okay, why did it actually benefit us? And why is it a thing? You know, and I, I feel like this is really helpful because from that perspective of, okay, well, we need to get that social connection and we need to get uh, probably attention sometimes, uh, you know, yeah. showing and displaying sadness is, is a way to do that. Uh, but I also know, this is interesting, a, a lot of people, when they are sad, they mm-hmm. hide away from others. Right. So, you know, people have different coping strategies in a way. Yes. And I feel cool. like it's something that is probably the hardest for me to understand sometimes because yeah. for me personally, it's easier for me to reach out to my friends when I'm sad. Not all the time, though. And it depends on what kind of friend it is, which kind of sure. situation it is. So not to everyone. But I do notice that it's not the same for all people. Yeah. So it's to me when I work with people, a lot of the things that happen are they get different messages growing up, usually cultural, whether it's about who they are as a person, whether they're a boy or a girl and what that means, where they're raised, what kind of family they're a part of and what that means, how their family copes with their sadness and teaches them to cope with any emotion. So there's a lot of different messages that can get really confusing. But the unfortunate part is for a lot of people, they never actually learn to have an outlet. And because of that, they never really learn to label their emotions. For some people, there's a whole condition called alexithymia, where they really can't connect words to sensations or emotions. And so they'll never really be able to share necessarily many emotions unless they do something like therapy. And there's a lot more people like that out there because there could be a lot of confusing messages people receive growing up. Because as you see, there's no like one book people would learn like what emotions are. I think there should be. But unfortunately, we don't really teach people all this stuff all the time when they have kids. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think that's a really important point, right? Because um, a lot of families would raise their children in the sense that uh, when they say, when they talk about sadness, it's like, oh, it's a bad thing. You know, focus on mm-hmm. the happiness side of thing. And it's very common. You know, this is not a bad thing per se, because I think for a lot of people, they're still trying to understand all these emotions that they have and even parents you know when, when they try to talk to their kids when the kid is sad it's hard for them to deal with the situation because they don't even know how to deal with it themselves and right. I, I guess you know that's why we need to have this constant loop of education right and sometimes younger generation teaches the older generation how to deal with emotions and I find that it's it's actually the same for me and my family um, and I guess it's also about this relationship between sadness and happiness. And you're so right in saying that, you know, culture plays a really big factor here. Um, And so I guess this question, we always ask, uh, uh, you know, a question about the relationship between the topic and happiness, because obviously that's what the show is about. And for today, we'd love to hear your perspective. Obviously, I I know by now, a lot of our audience know what sadness and happiness kind of do for each other. They kind of, you know, they they help us to recognize the other thing, right? Uh, But what else is beyond that? You know, what what other things that we should notice with, when it comes to the relationship between sadness and happiness? Sure. So I don't know if you've ever seen the Disney Pixar movie Inside Out. Yes. Um, I love that you movie. have. You love that movie. So spoiler here, if you haven't, a lot of what I'm going to say is directly from that movie and from a guy right. named Dr. Dr. Paul Ekman. Uh, his life work is all those emotions, all those nonverbal Theoretically universal because they're nonverbal emotions. 
And the the big question in the movie that Joy Happiness has, who's the main character, is what's the purpose of sadness, right? She doesn't get what these other emotions are doing, but especially sadness, because it seems to slow everything down and pull things aside and make everything feel a very different way than when Joy's around. But by the end of the movie, what she realizes is that they both connect people to each other. So yeah. sadness and happiness are really the only major connective emotions, as opposed to something like fear or anger, which pushes people away in order for you to either feel safer. Happiness uh, and sadness both require you to get closer to people. And this is really crazy. It requires you to actually share some of your nervous system with somebody else's nervous system. And so when we study it now, even more so from neuropsych scans and from neuroscience, specifically polyvagal theory, we learn that this social back and forth that happiness and sadness do is really, really unique. And it's a part of being a human being. It's kind of our mutant power if you want to go back to the X-Men. And that big mutant power is that through sadness and happiness, we can share big things that make us either feel more comfort or safety, like when we share our sadness through our nervous system to calm down each other. It's called co-regulation. Or to make ourselves very happy and feel very together, like when we're celebrating something as a group, like when there's like a marriage or somebody's birthday, these big cultural, social experiences where we're trying to cultivate the sense of community. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you referenced the movie Inside Out because I remember when I watched it for the first time, I was like, I wish they make more movies like this, you know, just mm -hmm. to teach people about such simple things. And, you know, when parents take kids to the theater and see this, they're going to learn as well. Yeah, I, I've, I've had so many parents who I literally say, go watch this movie, <laughs> go watch Inside Out, and then yeah. come back to me and we'll talk about what emotions you think don't, don't come out and yeah. what you want to teach your kid about emotions. Yeah, well, that's amazing. I really, really love that. I think it's something that... Um, Disney does well, you know, like with this new wave of movies, I feel like mm -hmm. that's probably one of the best movies that I've seen. Now that you've mentioned that, I got to watch it again. Such it's a, good a one. really good movie. I mean, and it really the other big thing it talks about, which is why we need sadness is because how many losses are people going to experience in their lives? And when you experience a loss, it's really, really healthy to feel sad because it means you had a strong connection to whatever you were uh, lost, whatever's feeling missing. It also means that you need more support and comfort from people to help you basically take your nervous system down a notch in order for you to heal and recover and let sadness pass. But really big sadness like grief, like when somebody dies or when hard things are going on around you in the world, it makes sense that you might slow down. It makes sense you might feel a little more uh, cold in your body or a little more... Uh, La lacking in energy. Anything along those lines are really good signals that you're probably feeling a little sad. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, and I think in the, with the state of the world right now, you know, that is such a, a big thing that everyone is probably feeling, right? And right. Uh, again, I, I'm not one for politics. I don't understand it as well as, you know, the next person. But I would say everyone knows what I'm talking about um, mm. at, at the moment. There's so much going on. And I feel like, you know, with all the in Melbourne, we have a lot of protest about it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of like this, this thing where you can see it in everyone's face. Yes. Everyone is extremely sad about it. And it's, it's just, when you see it, it's actually going right back to the topic's name, right? The evolutionary purpose of sadness. When there's this connection between all of these people about the same sadness that they're feeling they actually do something mm -hmm. about it to get through it together you know because it's mm -hmm. so hard to just sit there and feel the sadness so th that turns whatever they're feeling into actions right but also i don't need to speak another person's language to know what their face looks like when they're going through so much pain and we're all seeing the same images coming out of gaza and coming out of, of the congo and all these horrible horrible losses of lives. Um, and of course you're going to feel sad. Yeah. That makes you so human. It makes you so part of our tribe, this humanity of all of us. And so it makes sense that people would want to take action and, and make sure that the sadness doesn't continue. Yeah. And that absolutely. makes a lot of sense too, at the mm. same time. To me, it's a lot healthier if we can take some space and look at what the grief does to us, slows us down, makes us not want to fight each other. 
um, in order to make sure that everybody's okay. And so yeah. that's generally what sadness evolved to do. So we as a larger tribe of human beings could work together instead of becoming overwhelmed by the things out there that can make us really, really sad. So like mm-hmm. if one year you, you lose all of your crops and half of the tribe starves and some people die, you're going to feel really, really sad. There's no way to get through that without the other members sharing their sadness, making some space to hold it. So every individual member isn't overwhelmed. When you hold some other people's sadness, and this every psychologist knows, it lifts some of the weight off of them. They talk about feeling lighter. And if you remember what I said, happiness to me is a lightness and a warmth that a lot of people simply get when they see somebody else cares enough to, to feel some of their sadness. Yeah. And when we can do that for each other, we can do amazing things because then we don't get stuck in any emotion. We can actually plan and go forward and build these amazing societies, these amazing cultures that we've created. Yeah, absolutely. And I, again, this goes right back to its evolutionary purpose, right? It's not just, I mean, on the individual level, obviously, it's going to do a lot for us. And I think through this show, our audience probably uh, have learned by now that, you know, sadness allows us to see the light better. It allows us to appreciate the good moments even more and it allows us to to heal and to work through things that we probably haven't thought about in a while and um, it helps in many ways but beyond that it it affects social interactions it affects relationships and uh, you briefly touched on that before and I would love to get into that a bit deeper because um, it's not about just ourselves right it's not just about uh, this is the emotion Mm -hmm. that I'm feeling right now, sadness. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also affects how we are interacting with others, how we are, you know, maybe lifting others up or dragging other people down Mm -hmm. unintentionally, perhaps. So how do you think and how do you actually see this uh, in the context of, you know, psychology, obviously, when, when it comes to sadness and happiness? How do they affect our social interactions? How do they affect our relationships? Well, I would say for sadness, it makes things a lot clearer what's important to people. Usually because you start to feel more pain in your everyday experience and you start to slow down naturally. I think the mistake many people make is they don't make space to slow down in their daily lives, especially with these devices and things. And so when we don't have time to sit with what we're feeling in our bodies, we can really miss big signals. And so sadness is just a signal to slow down and reach out to somebody else. And so I'd say the big relationship piece for sadness is a lot of people would call that neediness, but I would call that being social, as in I need to be social in order to get over this emotion, just like I need to be social most of the time in order to make more happiness happen. Because regardless of what your preferences are, we're a very social species and we're very, very miserable if we're isolated. The worst thing you can do to somebody is put them in solitary confinement because this is so built into our brains and our nervous systems. And so I'd say with happiness, it's a lot easier because when we feel happy, it's usually very easy to see what we're doing. And when you think about some of your happiest moments, how how many of them are alone? None. What do you make of that? Well, happiness exists with others, not just by ourselves. I think all emotions do, but happiness and sadness, they really can't exist well without other people, which is why it's really unfortunate that people tend to hide their sadness because it's something that if you share with people, it actually often becomes lighter. What I notice for a lot of people is that when they try to hide it or numb it out with drugs or alcohol or work, that's where their relationships take a hit. It's not when they actually are open and say, this is what I'm blue about. This is what I'm feeling sad about. That usually brings people together and it lets people feel really loved and trusted when they have a friend look at them with tears and are willing to share. So the other thing that people don't realize is that if you're on the other end of somebody who's sad, you're getting one of the nicest, kindest praises you can from your friend or from that person about you. Uh, And that can feel really good. It's a very social experience. Yeah. So in absolutely. some ways, when people share that you're sad with you, it can actually make you happy about how much they trust you and how much love is in the relationship to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, when when you described all of that, like it, a lot of things are going through my mind. And I just think about the fact that um, I have observed and sort of noticed, and this is my personal observation, could be wrong. 
But I feel like men tend to hide sadness a bit more. Now, um, we have, you know, uh, like not just men and women, we have a lot of other genders nowadays. So sure. I'm trying to be inclusive. Um, and so, you know, with the language of psychology, I would love to hear from your perspective. We mainly categorize um, genders by men and women, right? So yeah. feel free to throw in other information if you have any. But how do you, how do men and women differ in that sense? You know, because the evolutionary purpose of sadness, as you were saying, it sounds universal to me, but there might be a slight difference when it comes to men and right. women. I think there's a big difference. I'd say, let's say anybody that's been socialized to express ma more masculinely, regardless of your gender. Men traditionally are socialized to hide a lot of emotions and to be stoic, as well as to be tough and cognitive. Those are often traditional messages cross-culturally that men will receive or people who want to express in a more masculine way when they're in society. What's unfortunate about that is it's the exact opposite of what you need to be able to do to access and use your emotions well. It basically is teaching a whole class of folks from a very young age that you don't want to use this really cool mutant power that all humans have. It's really sad. And the reason that you don't want to use these powers is because vulnerable emotions and, and like sadness or fear are often met with mocking or derision or other weird, confusing messages from adults and from other peers when you express them. So, for example, when we look at studies of, of children as they start to develop language, we notice there's no real differences to, between uh, sexed, uh, gendered, cisgendered boys and girls. But when we look at another couple years later, there's massive differences in their ability to use emotional vocabulary, largely because of how they've already been socialized. If you've ever been on a playground and you've seen a, a little boy crying, you might notice people giving him really weird messages like tough it out or yeah. come on, don't cry. Whereas when you see a little girl fall down, what messages are you hearing? Are you OK? Oh, you're very sad. It's going to be OK. But right there alone, you're teaching very different ways to reflect on a very similar experience. And so when we look at those studies, the brain development is vastly different by the time that these children reach adulthood, let alone adolescence, which really makes their relationships a lot tougher if you've yeah. been more traditionalized, traditionally socialized as masculine or male. Yeah. You know, like when when you described that, I got hit with a wave of sadness, speaking of the topic, right? Because it's so sad. I, yeah. I believe that, you know, regardless of your gender, you should be able to to be socialized in a way that nurtures you in, in, you know, with, with healthy growth as a human and emotions are crucial to our growth as humans. And I believe that all of these issues that we have in the world right now is are because we don't understand emotions. We don't know how to work through our own issues. And yeah, the, most of that come from men, unfortunately. Yes. I think the, the, the really, the nasty part is these, these social definitions, they really serve, systems like patriarchy really, really well. So I don't think that's an accident with why they've been socialized, why they've been binary even, why there are these specific roles that people can take up. But also yeah. it's a big problem if you're only socialized to be able to express anger or aggression when you're hurt. This is what happens, the kinds of death and horrible responses to, to loss of life that we're seeing in the world right now. Um, if that's what you're socialized, if you're socialized to see pain as something that you sit with and reflect on and share with other people, you don't go into anger so quickly. A lot of the work I wind up doing, a lot of the reason I do this work is to help so many men actually access their full emotional intelligence because that's what they get deprived of in childhood. It's really unfair. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think that is such important work that you're doing. Um, and I believe, you know, like, like this is something I'm definitely going to bring up with my male friends the next time I catch mm -hmm. up with them because everyone could benefit from this. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because I was talking to a friend the other day and then we were talking about, you know, men um, and we were kind of saying, oh, you know, like they just don't respond really well to certain things, especially when it comes to emotions. Mm, depends, and that, but yeah, often. <laughs> Yeah, most of the time they don't respond very well to, to these things because they don't have the tools. They don't even know how to deal with it. And yeah, that's what you're doing. That's the work that you're doing, basically. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole thing called normative male alexithymia, which is the idea that 
based upon how boys are socialized, men don't develop the actual words or skills to even label the, the sensations in their body. And so they wind up growing up basically having no ability to express and take in emotions. And so a lot of what I wind up doing is repairing that with a lot of different men and a lot of different people who've had that experience. And it makes the quality of their relationships so much better. It makes their lives so much happier and it makes them feel so much less sad just to, just to get some ability to actually express that sadness because there's men out there walking around who's have had sadness inside of them that they haven't been able to access since they were six years old. I see men in their 40s and 50s that have been walking around for decades with all of this sadness. And when it comes out, it's very, very intense, but it's also very, very relieving. Yeah, that is definitely something to think about, you know. Um, and I, I think um, this education is important because I guess... If a man is tuning into this podcast episode and listening to this part, uh, that person might get a bit uncomfortable or they might start to wonder, oh, do I hold sadness in my body now? You know, that's probably the yeah. question. Well, it's, it's you're given a little sneak peek because I hope some some men are listening because I'm going to give you an exercise that's specifically created largely for men to feel stuff in their body as okay. a way to start making sense of emotions. But this is going to help great. anybody that has a hard time accessing or feeling their sadness. Okay, that's great. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're going to talk about that in the practice part. And we just have one more thing to cover before then. Mm -hmm. So perfect timing. Um, I think this is something that you sort of mentioned briefly before when you mentioned our little devils, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is something that is um, sort of getting in the way of, figuring all this out, especially when it comes to emotion, like sadness, happiness, and so on. So this this modern world that we're living in right now, you know, I, I would say I'm grateful, you know, it's a great place to be in. And, you know, there's so much that's, you know, people 50 years ago couldn't imagine that we would have. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful. But at the same time, it affects everything that we do, including how we are processing, understanding, and feeling our emotions like sadness and happiness. So how does this modern environment actually affect the way that we are, you know, processing through these emotions and um, especially the lifestyles that we have to, you know, not just the device that we have, but the lifestyle of constantly being busy and, and just constantly on the go and, you know, having so much to do at all times and being switched on with everything that's going on. Yeah, I think there's, there's a couple different pressures that come with the things that like digital media and digital technology at your fingertips. One of the big ones is the pressure to be happy or to celebrate happiness a lot, like on Instagram. As a big part of it, you'll notice that there's kind of two contents that you'll find on things like Instagram and TikTok. One big part of the content is like happiness porn or something, where people are basically supposed to be just sharing their like happiest moments, but often it's fake and performative. They're just trying to get experiences to document to other people as if they're happy when many people are pretty sad. And then there's a whole other class where you're seeing a lot of sad stuff in the world and difficult things in the world. Yeah. And that's obviously a new use of social media that people are trying to wrestle with. But both of these uses pump strong emotions into your system, like through your eyes, into your vagus nerve, all the way through your body on a neurological level at such a speed that people can't really fathom it. To the point where they have algorithms where they know what content they can push at you in order to make you do a certain behavior. And while that technology might be very helpful for sales, it's not so helpful for slowing down and experiencing anything. You might be really confused when you go on social media, especially if you're on it for more than a couple hours, let's say, with what you're feeling at all. Be very distant from your feelings. Yeah, yeah. that is so true. Honestly, like I, I feel like it's a it's a big problem nowadays for those that are actively engaging in social media. Um, and I, you know, I try to cut down on the amount of time I spend on social media these days. Like I, I turn off all notifications. I only visit it once or twice a day. Still hard to process. Anytime I go in, there's something that's going to trigger my emotions or like trigger how I feel, and then that would sidetrack me from whatever I'm doing. And I'm like, oh wait, why did I end up here? You know, it wasn't the place that I was in before, especially when it comes to emotions, right? Especially with the things that are happening in the world right now in Gaza, 
specifically, I'm like, I don't know how to deal with this. You know, I already have so much sadness and things that I'm dealing with personally. And now I'm hit with this wave of sadness in the world. And I don't Mm -hmm. know how to deal with all of this. It gets overwhelming sometimes. I think one of the big reasons you're seeing all these large protests is because people want to be around other people who are feeling sad or feeling what they're experiencing. They don't want to be alone and feel helpless in it. And if that's the only reason you're going, I think it's a great reason to be around other people, just so you're not alone with the kind of pain that we're all experiencing. It just makes you human. That's all it does. That's all it means. It's really heavy, though, and it's very hard because when we see that amount of loss, like, like, anybody, it's going to leave a huge amount of pain uh, for us to have to share. Again, if you understand that sadness is something you're supposed to share, that it's something that will pass if you do share it with other people, it changes your entire experience of what you have your sadness for. Yeah. What I will say, though, is, and this is, this has been on my mind for a while, and I guess it's related to this topic, particularly, I do think that, you know, uh, sadness has its evolutionary purposes, as we just, we've been discussing. And I guess in the context of, um, you know, what's going on in the world right now, I just, I cannot ignore the fact that there's a lot going on and a lot of people are sad and they, they band together because it helps, like you're saying, definitely it brings out the best in people um, while, you know, the worst in people are being brought out at the same time. But I also do know that from my personal experience right now, this year has been extremely tough for me on a personal level. And I feel that sadness. And I was talking to my friend the other day and I was saying, you know, like the sadness that I'm feeling is teaching me a lot and Mm -hmm. it's kind of redirecting me in my life. And it's not that I'm ignoring what's going on in the world right now, but I feel like I cannot take on more than what I'm dealing with. And if I'm not able to work through my own sadness, why would I embrace even more, you know, on me? Like I understand and I know perfectly what's going on. And, um, you know, I try to read up more on it if I can, if I have the energy, but like energy management to me, I think is so important, right? When you're so sad and you're so caught up in whatever it is that you're going through, you want to be able to work through that first before you go and you work on anything else, like especially for yourself and your relationships. Because I told my friend, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how to show up for you. And my friend's like, why are you being so silly? You, you are showing up as you are and that's totally fine. And that's so beautiful, right? Because she's understanding, like, you know, so that's lovely. But at the same time, I've been seeing a lot of criticism on people that are staying silent over the situation in Gaza. And I'm like, I'm one of those people, actually. I know what's going on, but I'm staying silent. And I'm not going to apologize for that because I'm dealing with my own wave of sadness as a human. Yeah. I need to work through that. And for me, staying silent, it doesn't mean that I don't care. I think like I talked about with Instagram being performative on happiness. Yeah, exactly. I think there's a lot of performativeness on emotions that is really, really shitty and painful. And I don't think um, that a lot of people realize that, you know, what you're saying makes a lot more sense, which is we're going to have authentic, real experiences of our emotions and we get to choose how we're going to share them. Nobody's going to, you don't have to share them in any specific way. And you certainly shouldn't feel like you have to perform a specific exactly. emotion when it's very heavy. So I would yeah. say that's another one of the really nefarious things of the culture of social media, let's say, that's kind of mm-hmm. making emotion and other parts of navigating emotions more difficult. So I'd say that's maybe yeah. a new cultural phenomenon. Yeah, it is, it's tough, right? Because I feel like mm-hmm. maybe maybe I'm not the only one dealing with this. Maybe there are people in our audience who might be struggling with this right now as well. And I feel like social media is a tricky place to be in right now, especially. I don't think it's a great place at all right now to have strong emotions. Yeah. So, you know, like <laughs> mm-hmm. I just think as as individuals, and when we're talking about the science of happiness and, and so many other things in life, I, I, I guess it's just good to put things into perspective and be a bit more understanding, you know, um, especially when it comes to this modern world, this modern lifestyle that we have, there's so much to navigate and it's important to be understanding of other people's sadness as well as happiness. Um, It's already a tricky place to navigate. So I don't think it's healthy to criticize anyone for feeling the sadness or not feeling the sadness or expressing Mm. it or not expressing it. You know, it's, it's a tricky place. And it's also parasocial. What we're talking about isn't parasocial, it's social. So I'd rather you be with your friend 
right yeah. next to them sharing how horrible you feel about things. Yeah. Then trying to simulate it by posting a meme on a social media site and then hoping yeah. your friend or somebody DMs you so you can actually have a one-to-one like text conversation where you don't get to see their facial expressions or you don't get to hear the tone of their voice or they can't give you a hug or hold your hand or any of these yeah. other beautiful things we do socially as human beings yeah. uh, with each other when we're in pain. And I yeah. think more people, the best thing you can do is put down your phone and go hug your friend if you're having a hard time. If you yeah. want to do something that's really helpful for society, tending to your own feelings is always going to be helpful. I promise. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm so glad you said that because that's what I've been struggling with. And I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm like, am I wrong for for wanting to work this out for myself first and then, you know, like work on whatever else I can as part of this society? Um, and it's like you're saying, it's not, you know, we all have our different waves of sadness sometimes. And, you know, this is at the moment, it depends on where you're, where you are in the world, what situation you're in. And I just, I cannot begin to, to describe, uh, you know, yeah. all of the emotions that everyone is feeling. So I guess, you know, this is important for all of us to understand, especially, um, I think today we've covered quite a broad spectrum of, you know, like where you stand, you might you might understand it well, you might not understand it well. And, you know, it's super important for you to work through it yourself, understand it first for yourself before you help anybody else. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to have a practice. And speaking of which, we are in mm-hmm. the practice part, I was going to say. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Great segue. So I only have one question in this part. Mm-hmm. Which practice do you employ to embrace the evolutionary purpose of sadness that you would like to share with our audience? So I would say if you're going to do one practice, and this is something you can do every day, maybe not before you go to bed, maybe it's more like something you do around dinner time or right after dinner time. But I want you to make sure that you've been disconnected and not looking at a phone for at least 20 minutes. So maybe over a meal or maybe you're taking a bath or a shower or you just come out of the gym. But I want you to make sure that you haven't been actively on a device for about 20 minutes so your brain's actually able to focus. So that's the first steps. And the next thing I want you to do is I want you to open up a note on your phone or I want you to take a piece of paper or a pad and I want you to write down some answers to some of these questions. And the first question I want you to think about and write an answer to is what's something that's bringing you any level of pain in this moment? It doesn't have to be new every day. It might be the same thing. If you're having a hard time thinking about what brings pain, think about any people you miss who have died, any pets that you miss who might have died or who might be sick, any people who are sick that you're very worried about and you also are concerned with might fit here too, anything that you've seen in the world that makes you very, very sad. These are things that would make sense for you to write down or reflect on. And so you'll take a moment to do that. The next step is locating in your body any sensations you're feeling. So for example, if you're feeling sad, you might notice that your breathing is a lot slower. You might notice your thoughts are a lot slower. You might notice that your body feels a bit colder When we look at MRI scans of people's bodies when they're sad, really sad or grieving, they look very different. They look almost like they're they're freezing almost compared to when they're very happy and their whole body's lit up. So it makes sense that you might feel some, some real coldness or chilliness happening at that time. And so just noticing what that sensation is. And then I want you to answer this question. What is this sadness? What is this emotion telling me? What do I need in this moment? What's surprising about that? And finally, who is somebody who's been kind to me that I could share this with if I wanted to? And I want you to think about that. And if you don't have a person like that, I want you to imagine who's somebody who has been kind to me and what would they think about what I'm feeling right now? And here's your bonus thing. You don't have to do this. If you feel like it, I want you to text or reach out to that person that you thought of and let them know you're feeling sad and that you like that they listen to you and thank them for being kind. And that's the practice. 
Oh, I love that. What a great list. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think everyone could benefit from that list at any point. Wouldn't you like it if your friend called you up and said, you know what? I'm really sad and I want you to know. Thank you so much for listening to me. You've been such a good friend. It's really a Absolutely. nice social experience to get. Yeah. And a lot mm -hmm. of people, this is what I think they're looking to simulate on these apps. But you can do it. You can even do it through text. But you can <laughs> yeah. always do it. Yeah, absolutely. One -one. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you know, that's what my best friend and I do for each other. And, you know, we don't call each other very often because, you know, life's busy mm -hmm. and, you know, you miss calls most of the times these days because, you know, you're doing something, you cannot pick up yeah. the phone. But I know when she's calling, she she definitely needs to talk about something important and I would make time if I cannot pick up, I'll call her back straight away. Um, and most of the time it is over something sad. Yeah, because you know when when we're happy, we're making you know uh, making plans to hang out anyway. So when it's a call, I'm like, okay, need to prioritize this. And um, yeah, I have been noticing that even though these conversations are sort of heavy sometimes because they're about sad things, they help a lot with our relationship. Yeah, what do you and notice? How how much closer do you feel to your friend after those talks? So much closer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big questions, one of these joke memes are going around about like, what's the solution to male loneliness? You might have seen this. And this is like Men's Mental Health Month. And I'd say it's not a joke. One of the big solutions is learning how to share your sadness. Because if you can do that, you're going to feel so much closer to so many more friends. I think a big mistake a lot of people make is they put it in one or two people when they can choose to do this practice with as many people as they trust. And it's really nice to have a lot of people who you know will be there when you're feeling low or when you're feeling alone and cold. That's kind of the evolutionary piece. The other magical thing is this is what our nervous systems are built for, folks. If you have mutant powers, you should use them. Love it. Yeah, amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing the practice. And I hope that, you know, our audience will give it a go at least once, see how it feels and, you know, yeah. keep doing that. Yeah, it's going to be great. All you got to do yeah. is slow down a little. Yeah, exactly. Just take some time, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what we're so bad at nowadays. Take some time for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we've covered quite a few things today. Some of them heavy, some of them light, but most mm -hmm. of them really educational. And I think um, I've learned a lot through this conversation and, you know, lots of new terminologies for me as well when you were, you know, explaining the evolutionary purpose of sadness. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully it's the same for our audience. It's been fun for them to learn. Before we let you go, we've got open mic and this is your platform to talk about anything you're passionate about or anything that you would like to share with our audience. Um, I know you want to talk about your upcoming book, so please take yeah. it away. Sure. So everything I've been talking about today when it comes to things like your nervous system or how you co-regulate other people through strong emotions like sadness, it all has to do with your polyvagal system. And so I have a whole book coming out to help people that struggle with panic and anxiety, which is a lot of people I've worked with, and maybe some folks can relate to it out there. And it's called When Panic Happens. Short Circuit Anxiety and Fear in the Moment Using Neuroscience and Polyvagal Theory. It's going to be out in July. And I don't know, maybe in the future we can talk about anxiety because a lot of the same things that people encounter and difficulties that they have with accessing sadness, it runs through the same problems they have with being able to slow down and learn how to use their nervous system to actually stop panic attacks. So if you buy this book, You'll learn a bunch of different exercises for how you can short out or stop a panic attack using just your body. Amazing. That's basically, yeah. Thank basically you for what sharing. I'm working on now. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. And it's coming mm -hmm. up really soon. So we're going to be excited to find out more about it and, you know, yeah. grab a copy when we can. Um, you can pre order so, it right now on Amazon if you want. Anybody who oh, wants to on Amazon, you can pre order it there on Barnes and Noble. They're all up. Just look for okay. New Hay Arbringer. And when panic happens. There we go. That's great. We have a destination to go to. And speaking of which, if our audience would like to get to know more about the book, pre-order the book, or get to know you more, where should they go? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn at Dr. Uh, C. Schaefer NYC uh, on LinkedIn. You can also find me on uh, TikTok and on Instagram. If you look up uh, Dr. Chuck Schaefer, I'm the only one. Amazing. You'll find me pretty quick. 
Amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks again for being here today. I would definitely love to have you back to talk about anxiety. That's like a topic that is always helpful. So many people are dealing with it right now, including myself. So we're going to, you know, we're going to have a great time, hopefully. And yeah, let's make time for it. Absolutely. This has been so fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm glad. You have been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights podcast produced by the Happiness Science Labs a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website, ha.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Lungo. Thanks for tuning in.